Sean Latter, Wealth Manager at Cuesta, and Cheryl Howard, the MD of Cheryl Howard and Associates. We're talking trusts this evening. I remember, guys, in in the sort of late 80s, early 90s, I know I'm giving my age away, I'm 47, okay, there, end of story, I'm 47, now you know. There were a lot of people I knew um, who were starting CCs and uh, the, the family trusts and all, all the rest of that. Um, and I would imagine quite a lot of those people would still, a lot of them probably wouldn't have their CCs anymore because I think it's pointless having, having one uh, these days. Um, but a lot of them would probably still have their trusts. It does bring about the question, how often do you have to look at that trust and see if it's still effective? F you know, you set it up for yeah. a reason, but times change and policy changes. Right. Tax laws change. Tax laws change. I mean, the reason that people would have set them up in the late 80s, early 90s was purely for tax purposes. Um, and those tax um, advantages have now all been ring-fenced and there is no reason for actually setting up a trust as far as um, tax planning is concerned. Um, to answer your question, how often should it be looked at? It's actually got to be looked at annually because if you were running your trust properly in the form of doing your financial statements and doing your trustees um, minutes, even though um, there might not have been movement in the actual assets from year to year, one still has to ratify those transactions annually. You've actually got to look at it annually. And then I would advise together with your financial planner, you sit down probably every three years and say, right, this is the reason I set up the trust. Um, are these reasons still valid? Do we still need to have the cost and the pain and all the hassle of literally keeping it going? Or is there a way then to, to terminate and distribute ah, the assets? You see, you've admitted it now. No, You've admitted it. There is pain. <laughs> there is pain. Yes. <laughs> no that's pain, what I said no gain. right in the beginning. <laughs> Everything comes at a price. <laughs> um, Sean, as far as the, the, the trusts are concerned, when were you, you have clients. When, mm -hmm. when do you advise them to go into, into a trust? Because you were saying during the break, there are a lot of boxes that need to be ticked. That's right, Jeremy. I, I think a lot of people, and certainly when I, when I sit down with clients, the first thing is I want to set up a trust. I want to, I want to get rid of my estate duty problem. Okay. And I, I spoke about it right in the beginning where you have a principle of estate freezing. So I've had assets of 10 million. I wanted to transfer it into a trust. Okay. Mm -hmm. That asset remains at 10 million. Yes, there's a certain amount we can, we can sort of knock away at over the years, but it doesn't make that problem go away altogether. So one has to look at it and say, I'm looking at the future growth of this asset. That's what I'm limiting from an estate duty point of view. The initial asset that I put in there is by and large going to remain. Okay? So that, that's the first thing is to say, if that's the case and we're just looking at estate planning, we're looking at how much we can save into the future, which is fine. If that's your only sort of looking is to say I want to save on a state duty then one has to look at the flip side of the coin and say well how much is it going to cost me to transfer all of this money how much is it going to cost me to manage the trust etc 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 am I happy about losing control versus perhaps just saying if I need to pay that estate duty or if I need the liquidity in my estate how much is it going to cost me to just go to one of the life insurance companies and take out a life cover policy of a million rand so one has to balance it off and say that trust cannot be just about estate planning. It has to be about saying, am I going to protect myself uh, in terms of limited liability? All right? And it has to be a, a thing of saying, well, are there certain assets that I want to then have live on in, in perpetual succession, basically, for my beneficiaries and their children and potentially their children thereafter? So one has to look at it very, very carefully mm -hmm. uh, before taking on the type of trust structure. I would imagine then that what you're talking about here, quite honestly, is you're talking the way Sean's talking about your, their children and their children's children and all the rest of it. You're talking about really high, um, high net worth individuals. You're yeah. talking about families. You're talking about the Oppenheimers and, and, and people like that who, who would have family trusts which, which are there to protect their family lineage. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think imagine, to, to a large degree, yeah. Yeah, you've still got the family home. I mean, the, the people who've got family homes down in Eisner and, and the wilderness that bought them years ago, got them in trust and they're now going into third generation. Um, <clears throat> I've got clients in exactly that same position. And um, the other one is share options. Um, a number of clients um, and years ago, share options were in vogue and everybody made their wealth and the directors made their wealth by share options. And today you've got third generation still living on those share options. 
and there's nothing to stop the young entrepreneur of today or this um, uh, owner managed business literally starting that same legacy financial legacy so it is there's a sean's right on the basis of a, a balancing act because there's a cost of actually getting those assets into the trust as well be a transfer duty for property and or capital gains in that if you had the asset and you're now selling uh, selling it to the trust there's a capital gains You've tax got to event. Pay capital gains. Correct. Mm -hmm. So it's not okay, an easy. Okay, now let's start looking at some of those costs. Okay. So I've got a house in Joburg, and let's say I've got one in, you mentioned Neisner. Right. Okay. I want those to be put into a trust. I sell the two to the trust. Correct. I've got to pay transfer duty on that. Correct. And, you'll and have capital to pay gains. Capital gains, correct. That can cost a fair whack of money. Definitely. And again, it's the thing of saying, is that cost worth? the current or future benefit of setting up that trust. So one is we've got to be very careful in terms of blindly going into a trust because it sounds like a good idea. One also has to be very, very aware of what's happening in the broader financial life and where do these trusts then play a role. And that, that's one of the, the issues that I come across time and time and time again is where people have been given advice or taken advice almost in silos mm -hmm. without getting the big picture and say, let's get the big picture first. Let's understand where all these different components could fit in, and then let's go in and, and start calculating the costs. So if it doesn't make sense practically from an almost strategic overview point of view, then don't even worry about going and crunching the numbers and saying, you know, does the cost actually warrant it? Sometimes it's actually an easy answer. Okay, I can't think of a, a heck of a lot of uh, reasons why people would want to go into trusts from what I'm hearing. But you guys were banding around some numbers of how many trusts are formed, yeah, and there are lots. It, are, in, your, in your professional opinions, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Are a lot of people going into trusts for the wrong reasons and not getting good advice on this? I, I believe so. I would agree with that. Um, there's um, instances out there where you're literally having um, trust created per beneficiary. So if somebody's got three kids, they walk out with four trusts, one for mom and pop and one for each of the kids. I don't believe, depending on circumstances, I don't believe that's necessary. Um, I've also seen circumstances where um, an individual's come out, he's got three different businesses and he's literally got three trusts and three companies there's no need to create that extent of complexity. Um, so it is, I think um, people are going into trust for wrong reasons and people are literally being sold the package and all that they don't need from, you know, from their level of um, requirements, either from a financial point of view or from within their family perspective. You agree? Uh, absolutely, I think another aspect to that as well is that a lot of people are setting up trusts almost as, a, as an alter ego. So saying, I'm transferring this, I'm, I'm giving over control, but not really. Okay, and then one looks at it and says, well, what's the intention behind it? They're probably looking to, to save on tax in terms of estate planning, whatever the case may be, or they're trying to get it away from an ex-spouse or soon to be ex-spouse and try and hide that money away. Now, there's a lot of case law that's come out that's basically hammered that away and said, well, this is really a veneer, um, and that's actually an alter ego. Therefore, we're gonna go and take those, those assets. So I think a lot of people say, well, we'll set this up. It's not really mine, but at the end of the day, I'm maintaining control. And if things really come to the crunch, they're actually kidding themselves and, and they're not protecting themselves at all through that. So one has to be incredibly careful of how those trust deeds are set up, who the trustees, who the beneficiaries are, and, and how, um, yeah, I, I guess okay. the deed is, is worded. You know how much trouble you could have just caused in the last minute, Mr. Letter? Because <laughs> you could have a situation where are sitting at home right now is a couple and the wife is now going you set up a trust last week yeah are you leaving <laughs> what's me? happening yeah <laughs> but you don't know like in, in the age i mean this is also from a dating point of view i mean i started to um was involved in trust in the late um 80s and at that stage the taxation changed where previously all the tax was taxed in the hands of the husband and then they brought in the situation where a husband and wife could be taxed separately and um, we had a situation where a client had literally come in and they agreed that they were going to enter into a divorce create this trust set everything up um, within a trust from a tax planning point of view um, and the wife happily signed off and said no problem you know it's a tax planning structure and the week later they divorced and it was a legit divorce she walked away with nothing and he said but you signed everything so there are these reasons I mean there's people have d created trust for very silly reasons without thinking things through 
if, if you are going to, if you are advised to, and you agree with the advice that you've given, uh, set up a trust, mm -hmm. how, how should you br very briefly go about, how do you go about doing it? S setting up the actual trust? Yeah. I think that's, that's really Cheryl's... Uh, Basically, yeah. in sitting down, uh, drafting a trust deed, um, identifying who your beneficiaries are, and that's probably the most important. You don't have a trust if you don't clearly define who your beneficiaries are. So it's defining your beneficiaries, defining their objectives, um, and nominating your trustees. From a trustee point of view, again, I advise that you always have that independent trustee, and it mustn't be your brother-in-law that you're over the family bra on Friday evening, you say, hey, but I've just bought the following asset, um, can you just sign off the resolution? You actually do want somebody that does exercise some independence and control over... Um, could your financial advisor, for example, be a trustee? They could, yes, that's okay. not a problem. Um, then the trust is lodged with the master of the High Court, the original document is lodged with the High Court. Um, letters of authority are then issued and those letters, once those letters of authority are issued, the trust is then ready or the trustees can then essentially action the trust, enter into transactions, capitalise the trust in the form of transferring in the share portfolios and all the um, business assets, mm -hmm. the property, whatever the case is. Um, it can be done on a piecemeal basis, especially because of the exorbitant cost of getting in in the form of your um, securities tax to transfer in a share portfolio, the capital gains that's attached to it, the transfer duty. So normally what we would do then is sit down with the client and say, right, what is probably the most important asset that we want to protect at this stage? Let's Get move that, that in. one in and then the rest can be done over, you know, over on a piecemeal basis over a number of years. She's obviously f f f fairly fond of trusts because her whole company is based on is trusts. Based on yeah. trust. um, your whole company is not based on trusts, no. but it's part, the trusts would form part of the planning. Are you, are you a, a, a keen trust person? Jeremy, I, I, I think for the right person, there's no better vehicle than a trust. The problem is I would, I would say that most people that have trusts today possibly shouldn't and could possibly have other structures in place that are just as efficient, if not more efficient. So, so one has really to look at that. And, and, and I think just to come, come back to, I mean, Professor Walter Geech, who's, who's probably the, the, the sort of foremost mind in the country when it comes to trusts, uh, he estimates that 85% of trusts are basically null and void, they're not set up correctly. So even for the right person, sure. there's some people that actually don't have the right measures in place. So uh, I think, yeah, by so, and large, so most people know, but it's, it's for the right person. Check with your financial advisor first. And if you have got a trust, check that it's, it's been managed. the right thing. Correct.